Welcome to the Find Your Leadership Confidence Podcast with Vicki Nedling. You are about to discover impactful lessons that help you grow as an individual, grow your confidence, and find the positive and good within you, so you powerfully and authentically become the best version of yourself. Be sure you visit our website at www.findyourleadershipconfidence.com. While you're there, subscribe to us via your favorite network. Now tune in, get ready, and enjoy the journey of emerging as a leader of exception in the 21st century. Welcome everyone to the Find Your Leadership Confidence podcast. I'm your host, Vicki Nethling, coming to you from Roswell, Georgia. The goal of this podcast is to share topics and guests that will empower you to grow as a confident leader and take your business or your life to the next level. Today, my guest is Lauren Hunter. Let me tell you a little bit about Lauren. Lauren is a writer who loves exploring big picture of the journey we are all on together. Her career spans more than two decades in public relations content marketing, freelance writing, and publishing. She is married to her high school sweetheart, and they live in Northern California with their four children. Please join me in welcoming Lauren Hunter. Hey, Lauren. Hi, Vicki. So nice to see you and I know. talk to you today. Thank you for having me on your show. Yes. It's, it's taken a, a few times for us to try to get together, but I'm very excited about today. I think your topic, which is highly sensitive people, uh, the HSP is the acronym, so highly sensitive people is our topic, and I think my audience is going to be very intrigued by all of this. I always start out, though, with an easy, simple question, an icebreaker, and that question is, you said that you live in um, California, kind of give us a little bit about your home, you know, why do you like that part of the country? Um, That's a great question. I'm in Northern California, um, outside of Sacramento. So suburbs in the foothills off highway 80, heading up to Lake Tahoe, which is one of everyone's favorite spots, whether you're from California or not. Um, We're about an hour and a half, two hours, give or take. Um, But, but just an hour from here, is the first ski ski resort um, <laughs> and Donner Pass. So mm-hmm. we're um, we're fortunate to not live in the snow, um, but to be <laughs> but very can, close to the you snow. You can visit it. <laughs> you can yes, visit yes. it. So um, and we're in what what I love to call the two hour zone. So we're two hours from the San Francisco Bay Area, unless there's horrific traffic. We're about two hours from Half Moon Bay, the ocean. Yeah. Um, we're about three hours from Monterey and Carmel, um, oh, and about God. two hours from Lake Tahoe and two hours from Reno. So there's all of these, you know, uh, in less than two hours to Napa Valley. So like uh, an hour and a half to Napa Valley. So we're blessed. There's we have family in a few of those places, and um, so we can take day trips or road trips um, and hit any of those those places, which is nice because my husband doesn't like long car trips. So it's perfect. <laughs> <laughs> you have a little slice of heaven there for sure. So Lake Tahoe, my um, mom's uncle. Uh, who looked exactly like my grandfather lived in Lake Tahoe or in Reno and took us up to Lake Tahoe. And I just loved, loved that area. The pine nuts, that was the first time I was introduced to pine nuts. And um, I, all of those places in California, I loved. When I was region advisor, my territory was California. And I just love visiting there. All right, so we are going to get into some questions that will help the audience understand a little bit more about what you do. So why are people always drawn to a good story? That's a great great question. I um, I ask myself that. Um, my my I have two books available. My first book was um, I was really compelled to tell my own story, and um, and the topic is kind of unrelated to today, so I'm not going to dwell on that. But my story leaving a religious group called Christian Science and kind of um, finding my way to biblical Christianity, and so the story element, I just feel like my heart was pricked for this um, concept of story. Now I have an English degree. I've been a writer in and throughout. Um, even though I've had a 
professional career in content marketing and public relations. Um, I'm, I'm a poet and a creative writer nice. and have done that like all along the side. And so um, my author blog, laurenhunter.net has, um, you know, the things that you don't, you get to do for passion. Um, yeah. And so um, that first book, um, this, this idea of story. And as I interview people, I could see, um, you know, you have in the back of your mind, like you've read so many books and stories and um, I didn't, I didn't focus on creative writing in my degree. I focused more on career writing. Um, so I didn't, I, I don't have, um, a background of writing fiction, but you study tons of fiction mm -hmm. and you write tons of papers in college. And so the hero's journey is, is important. And then as my kids, I have four kids and they, um, the oldest is in college and then the youngest is 12. So four teens, basically, <laughs> um, I know. <laughs> Pray for me, please. Yes, honestly. <laughs> that's, um, that's what I was thinking. But, um, <laughs> as my kids have gone through school, um, they had one particular teacher that all of them have had, the, the last one is going to get her next year. They do this deep dive on the hero's journey. And my daughter was, was showing me this and it was before I wrote my first book and I'm like, wow. And then we were a Marvel star Wars family, you know, so we watch all these and I'm like every movie that comes out, it's like the same journey. Like mm -hmm. there's a savior, there's, um, you know, a good and evil, like every, yep. you know, so, so this concept of story is interesting to hear people tell me their stories. And, you know, it's, it's a, a highly emotional topic is is uh, leaving a, a religious group that your family brought you up in, and um, in that background, it tends to be third or fourth generation of people. So back to the 1800s, so it's like very lodged in this like family journey, if you will. Mm -hmm. So watching and interviewing people, kind of shifting that um, is is very interesting, and so it. My second book um, is called Write Your Journey, and I, I've always loved the, the word journey, and it's not so much about getting to the end of the journey, but, you know, the journey is about the the process, and so I know you as a leadership coach probably appreciate that yes, as well, so. that, gosh, there's so much that we learn in the journey, and so many of us want to skip right to the end. Yeah, absolutely. And that's actually not how things work. Right you know, the, all of the, all of the education and the value and the blessing that comes mm -hmm. from everything that we go through, it's like the journey that produces that. It's not the graduation or the diploma in hand or the high salary or whatever the thing is that you think that you want. It's, it's the steps before that, that really lead up to it, mm -hmm. that, that create that, um, that sense of accomplishment. And so, write your journey um was kind of born out of this whole um this whole process of looking at that and it's the subtitle is a step-by-step -step guide to write your life story fast and it's small um it's only like 128 pages but um looking at that um the, the components of what makes a good story mm -hmm. um and i don't use the word hero's journey i use um three three story arc or i forget what i say three it's narrative arc um, three act. I'm always mm -hmm. confusing it. Three act story structure. Mm -hmm. And so you have a beginning, a middle and an end. And so it, this, this book is like a small guide to help you write a slice of your life story, which for your audience, that could look like writing your career story. Um, when I, I did this and, um, recently published it on, on laurenhunter.net. Um, but just you, you kind of go high level and you look at the markers of like, yeah. what are the elements of story kind of taking a bird's eye view on your own story. Um, and, but it's a reproducible uh, skill to be able to take these elements of story. And then as you interview someone or as you write something for a client, or as you work with someone as a coach, um, you're kind of drawing, it's kind of this journey and these elements of story that we're drawing out of people. Right. Um, and so that, that's why like, and it feels like a passion that like, I'll never be done pursuing <laughs> this. Like you never get to the end, you know that's what I right. mean? It's just kind of like, in one sense, I love projects where you finish. In another sense, I love these big questions where you can just kind of ask un unending questions. It's um, the onion peel theory. Right, right. So that's a long, a long answer to your yeah. short question about story. Well, but it, it actually brought up a question in my mind too that 
the, the a lot of times people don't think their story is worth hearing. Mm -hmm. How do you answer that? So I, I kind of talk about that in the introduction of the book that, um, you know, everyone's story has value. I mean, number one, every person has value. And so I'm coming from that premise that every person has inherent value because they're a person. Um, and so everyone's story is inherently valuable. Um, mm -hmm. And it's, I, I think that we have to, sometimes we have to stop and, and look at that, especially if I was, if, if I was coaching someone through how to write their story mm -hmm. and they immediately a wall went up of like, well, my story's not that important. Um, you know, that's, that's a bigger fish to fry, if you will. Um, and sometimes we have to go back and maybe do, do some therapy or do some self-care um, and some, some introspection around like, what is that? Who told you that? Who told you that your story is not important? Um, often it goes back to childhood issues. Mm -hmm. um, and I experienced that myself where I felt like I was sidelined and, and not not important. Um, and that's, that's what a child hears when their, mm -hmm. their, their needs are not met, um, or some of their needs are not met. And so sometimes you might need to put something on hold and go back and say, okay, I need to do a deeper, deeper dive into here. Is there trauma? Is there, um, you know, major, um, self-worth issues and then come back to the table and be like, okay, I am valuable. I do have worth. Um, and then the next step is like looking at, looking at events. Uh, mm -hmm. So the book has like a timeline, like a infographic in there of a uh, timeline for your, there's three, um, three types of stories, uh, like a career story, a faith story, and a family story. And mm -hmm. so I have three different timelines and they can go to the website and look at, if you want to go look at those timelines, you can, it's uh, laurenhunter.net forward slash write your journey. Um, and they're downloadable there. Um, but it's cool because you can just plot some of the events. And as you're looking at the events of your life, out of that is going to come a theme. Yeah. Um, and so looking at story, but it's it's written for a non-creative uh, writer so that you'd be able to, to look at a bird's eye view. Yeah. Um, and, you know, taking it to sensitivity, um, I find that a lot of people who are consider themselves to be sensitive or highly sensitive, if they know that term, mm -hmm. Um, they're more, they, they know that they have value and they know that, um, their story is, has interest. And so, um, being able to, to step back and look at it from bird's eye view and then dial in and mm -hmm. share that sensitivity and those steps along the way is it really does. Everyone loves a good story. Yeah. Uh, do absolutely. you know a person who does it? I know, uh, you know, as you were talking and, and we're going to get into more about the highly sensitive person. But as you were talking, I was thinking about, you know, how you draw that out in a person. And it's just through conversation, really. And as that person, as you draw out some pieces of a story that they start, then you can show them how it's interesting to you. You know, every person that I interview, I'm amazed at the things that they've done in their life that they might think is like, oh, and it's like, no, but no, no, big deal. no, yeah, right. No, but that's something that is interesting. That is something that I want to know more about. And, and I think as you feed that, then the people will become more open and realize the value that, you know, what they have to say and what they, and, and also I think sometimes their story makes me think of my story. And that's, I think, what we want to happen is I want to put myself in your place. What would my story look like if I did that? I'm, I'm still recovering from COVID <laughs> five weeks later, so four weeks later. So forgive the, the cough. <coughs> um, yeah, the resonance. So it's resonating with uh, mm -hmm. other people's stories. Yeah. And an element of their story it hits us right in our hearts. Mm -hmm. It just has the power to, it's like that aha that Oprah coined, you know, um, what is the aha about the other person's story and how does that affect me and my own journey? As so as a mom, uh, a, a woman, especially a, a woman entrepreneur or somebody that aspires to be a writer or maybe now as you're talking is thinking, Maybe, you know, that possibility is there. 
how does being highly sensitive help you and in some ways inhibit you maybe from uh, achieving what you're trying to do? That's a good question. Um, so for, for those of you who, who haven't heard of that term before, I'm just gonna briefly define it. Um, highly sensitive person, capital HSP, uh, the acronym is HSP, um, was a phrase and a study and a trait coined by Dr. Elaine Aaron back in the 90s with her book, The Highly Sensitive Person which you can find on Amazon. Mm -hmm. um, she did uh, quite a vast study on traits of sensitivity uh, mm -hmm. on a cross se section of people and found that 15 to 20% of all human beings have this, these components of sensitivity. Mm -hmm. um, and that includes um, like noticing your environment more, um, higher sensitivity to stimuli such as uh, light and sound, uh, noise, um, uh, visual stimuli. Um, there's a lot of variation between mm -hmm. um, how people are wired, like their particular sensitivities within right. that spectrum. Um, and so, and, and there is a connection between if you've heard of sensitive sensitivity processing disorder, um, that is someone who, who struggles more with um, some of these issues versus uh, just more, um, they're affected by um, by things on a lower level. Mm -hmm. So that sensitivity um, can really um, help, I think, in a lot of ways. The positive ways are um, noticing, for me anyway, noticing uh, uh, changes in people's emotions, mm -hmm. noticing behaviors, noticing um, uh, nuances in the environment. Um, and those things are all, you know, a lot of writers tend to be highly sensitive because they're the people who are and musicians and artists, they're noticing things that a lot of people don't stop and notice. Um, so before I knew that I was highly sensitive, you know, I, I mean, I, I always knew that I was sensitive, but it wasn't until I was like 40 that I came across this book um, that uh, the highly sensitive person. And so mm -hmm. when I, she has a quiz in there that will help um, if you're curious. And then I, I also uh, run a blog that I started a year ago called HSP Journey. So mm -hmm. hspjourney.com, it's kind of a, a, a marriage of my uh, interest in journey and <laughs> highly sensitive person. Um, and so uh, if you go there, uh, you'll find an article uh, with a bunch of quizzes. I think I pulled eight, I forget the exact number, eight different quizzes to see if you're highly sensitive because quite a few different experts in the field do have their own kind of version of a quiz. Mm -hmm. um, so now I'm going to forget the original question because yeah. I've coughed and been trying not to cough. <laughs> so refresh no, my memory. So you, you gave <sighs> us some of the positives of being a highly yes. sensitive person. Uh, what are, if any, the negatives? negatives? Yeah, the negatives. Um, I'll just speak for myself because I, I think that just drawing from my own experience, maybe um, your listeners will resonate and then they can kind of add their own. Um, for me, not absorbing the emotions of the people around me, whether that's people in a workplace, um, like one company, this is years back, I, I was hired as the PR manager, and I swear on day three, they, they were about to do layoffs, and they laid off 30 people wow. just a minute after I was hired, and that put me in a really difficult emotional pickle because I was both excited to start a new journey in a yeah. new role. And then I felt survivor's guilt that I had just been hired and all these people were getting let go. Um, so um, that environmental kind of sensitivity mm -hmm. is tough. Um, anytime there's a lot of people like um, um, I, my husband is a teacher and then I've had four kids who've all gone through public school. We have really excellent schools um, here uh, in our city. And um, the first kid kindergarten, I remember um, being overwhelmed at the back to school night, you know, all the kids, all the parents, all the teachers, and a flood of emotion hit me about my own struggles with going to school. Um, mm -hmm. And as I learn more about the sensitivity trait, it's, it's so many people and so many emotions 
all of the things that they're emitting like in one place. And so as an adult, I've been able to look back and kind of do the the work to realize that I had no, I had no tools to deal with that as a mm. child. Um, so, um, and there's, there's different methods and different um, therapists who have different ways of dealing with that, but kind of building a bubble around yourself or an invisible clear umbrella, different <laughs> helps to kind of buffer you against. And I'm blessed now I've been um, an entrepreneur and a stay at home mom in and around all the work that I've done for um, 20 years. I started my uh, public relations consulting in 2002. So it just hit 20 years. 20 years. Um, and I've done a number of different uh, entrepreneurial ventures during that time, but you know, I don't have, I don't have that same challenge of um, having to be in a workplace where I'm surrounded mm -hmm. by people who, you know, are a terrible boss. Um, you know, a lot of HSPs do end up becoming entrepreneurs for a number of different reasons. One of which is controlling your environment, yeah, controlling your schedule. Um, I, uh, another positive, negative, um, you know, depending on which way you look at it, but energy. So uh, dealing with your own ups and downs of, of energy. Um, mm -hmm. And I, I was diagnosed with fibromyalgia also like 20 years ago. And so um, I, I have the dual struggle of kind of a chronic illness that deals yeah. with nerve pain and energy um, and also being highly sensitive, which I do think some, there are some connections there, like somatic um, processing. Um, and so, and I don't have a super severe fibromyalgia because I've known about this for so long. Like I, I have a power nap practice, a 20 minute power nap practice <laughs> that um, I practice almost every day because it resets me in a way, um, both with quiet and self-care and a brief uh, sleep period that that gives me energy for the rest of the day. And so I think often the challenges become the gift, you know, mm -hmm. and I mean, not always, but if you kind of approach it that way, that yes, I am more sensitive to a lot of different things, but it, it feeds into my creativity. It feeds into my parenting. It feeds into my self-care. I think I'm a decent friend. I'm sensitive to my friend's needs. Um, I'm able to love other people. I, I've learned to take care of myself in a way that allows me to pour into others. If I worked full time in an office full of people I couldn't stand, like I, I don't think that I would be the wife and mom and, right. and writer that I, that I am today. So, you know, you make choices along the way and those choices kind of develop who you, who you are, who you want to become. And, um, I just want to encourage anyone out there listening, like sometimes you, you might feel stuck in maybe you are working outside the home, um, you know, in a job that you don't like. Um, and so sometimes those incremental changes to inch you toward um, being an entrepreneur, whether it's doing something part time in the evenings or cutting back to 30 hours a week instead of 40 hours a week, like there's incremental ways to encourage yourself and to make choices toward um you know, however you want to better your life or your situation. So especially for women, I mean, there's never been a better time to have so many options for yeah. online businesses and uh, coaching and writing and um, virtual assistant work. And there's so many options. Yeah. So, I mean, that kind of is what drew me to my anti-aging wellness business as a side hustle, because I needed, I was in doing a project for the, a big corporation that was full of negative people and it was just not going well. And I needed to influx my brain with positivity and professional development. And, and so Neora does that every week, every week I was uh, being around people that were positive and uh, the self-development was there. And, and so it's important to, to kind of give your yourself that, as you said, that step towards being a, a better person to address your highly sensitiveness. I wanted to know, you talked a little bit about parenting. Parenting is no fun uh, sometimes. Parenting is a joy and, and is, is just um, an uplifting moment at times. As a, highly, as a parent of a highly sensitive child, or being a mom who's highly sensitive of <laughs> one to four children, if you will. Yeah. 
how do you manage that? I'm, and again, looking at the positive and the negatives. Yeah, that's, that's a vast, a vast topic. Um, so I had my kids take um, Elaine Aaron's, I think the website is hspperson.com is her website. Um, I had them each take her quiz and they have a, a version. She has another book called Highly Sensitive Child, which is a mm-hmm. book devoted fully to parents trying to mm-hmm. understand and figure out if their kids are highly sensitive. It's very, very helpful. Um, <clears throat> so I had each of them take the quizzes and like three out of four um, quizzed as pos- you know, positive for highly mm-hmm. sensitive. And, um, and the, four, the, the oldest one actually wrote a piece on HSP journey. Um, the title is, uh, can your highly sensitive child like grow out of being highly sensitive because he sort of um, grew out of it to a, to a degree, but is still very, has a high emotional, um, emotional quality or um, emotion. Yes. He, he, he has a depth of processing Mm -hmm. um, that is there, whether he thinks of himself as highly sensitive or not, (laughs) excuse me. Um, So I will say that there's a big difference between parenting highly sensitive young women and girls Mm -hmm. and, and young men. And the culture of masculinity is quite, quite different. And boys, and this might be true, my oldest, as well as my younger son, um, they learn um, like the end of elementary school and that sixth grade, um, seventh grade, middle school zone, um, that they they can't keep all their cards kind of out on the table. They sort of have to hold their cards a little bit closer to mm-hmm. the vest um, to kind of get along in boy culture and boy mm-hmm. uh, society. And so, but I've found that with with boys having a safe place to converse with them about their emotions and to give them a wide berth for exploring those emotions and expressing um for crying if they if they are crying not to say you know um crying is not okay yeah. you know all of that nobody stuff that cries at passe baseball. nobody <laughs> there's no crying in baseball yeah, yeah. No, I, I'm here to tell you there's definitely crying in baseball yeah <laughs> yeah it just doesn't happen on the field you know uh the coach didn't want the girls to cry in a league of their own on the field right yes <laughs> off the field is a different different mm-hmm. situation um and so uh, coaching them through mostly, it seems like relationships with other kids is the, the, the most difficult zone, both boys and girls. Um, I had uh, uh, several of my kids go through just intense emotional upheaval with relationships, uh, tipping, tipping heavier on the girl side, you know, the girls in middle school. It's like yeah. these young ladies go from being sweet girls to nasty, uh, mm-hmm. backstabbing, mm-hmm. Um, you know what? And um, so that yeah. has been a journey with with both my girls, uh, coaching them. I one of my best friends is is a therapist, a licensed therapist, and we have such great conversations. And I'm like, I feel like I have a full time job coaching and having therapy sessions with four kids. Yeah. <laughs> so I it. that, that is also like, how do you, you know, it's like the question, how do you, how do you do that? Um, having enough space in my schedule and in my life um, to talk with them and to work with them. And that, that for me looks like more space probably than the average person, because I need like a pre and a post recovery from <laughs> talking with them and encouraging them. And, um, and my, my, um, my youngest has gone through a lot. Fortunately, um, it, it doesn't feel like all four are going through major stuff all at the same time. We have had kind of moments like that. Um, we got our first kid off to college and he, uh, expressed concern that it was perhaps not the right place for him. Like, the second day before we had even left <laughs> and then a week in, we're like, buddy, you got to give it some time a week in, two weeks in, you know, we're, we're coaching him and, and counseling him and, um, and it wasn't the right fit. Yeah. And, but we gave him space to figure it out to be sure. And we didn't, we didn't, um, we didn't uh, gaslight him and say, mm-hmm. you know, oh, you're just feeling freshman angst, you know. And, mm-hmm. No, it it really wasn't the right fit, and the classes weren't right, and the environment wasn't right. <laughs> he, we gave him that autonomy um, mm-hmm. to make a choice to change, 
and the change was great. Um, and it was, you know, I mean, it kind of sucked for us because we're like, <laughs> We just got you there, you know, yeah. one kid down, like three to go, you know, yeah. no, um, but it just took a little bit longer. And I think that's where, um, and this is the one who says he's not highly sensitive. So, <laughs> you know, <laughs> so, um, you know, they take longer yeah. to bake in the oven, if you will, like, um, you know, extra time, extra love, extra, um, uh, extra space. Um, I will say one of the negatives coaching um, teen girls has been that my um, emotional feathers, if you will, are up in a tizzy, you know, and, and so are hers. And, and this happens in any, you said you had a daughter, mm -hmm. um, you know, if you're wired similarly, you're going to butt heads. If you're wired differently, <laughs> you're also going to butt heads. So, so, um, you know, trying to differentiate like what's my stuff and what's their stuff. And then what's mm -hmm. the stuff that I, um, can speak into for them. Right. And I, I, my, um, therapist, uh, a year or two ago recommended, I read codependent no more, which I had not come across, which, um, you know, I don't know where you are in your life listeners, but, um, that is a valuable book to read no matter if you have addiction in your life or your spouses or families or and everyone knows somebody with addiction, it does focus on, mm -hmm. but, um, the, the codependency, um, can happen in relationships and especially yeah. with children, we often will do things for them that they don't need done. Um, and so for me, it was a big eye opener to look and see the different ways that I was trying to, I was calling it parenting, but I was sort of acting codependently in a few ways. Um, and emotionally getting my emotions mixed up with their emotions. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so being able to um, sit back from that and journal, if you have teenagers, having a therapist, I would highly recommend if you haven't done that before. Um, at every stage, every new stage kids go through, it, it brings up all your own stuff from your own childhood. And if you have things that you haven't worked out, um, I, I encourage you to to get with somebody, either a coach like Vicki or a therapist or a psychotherapist or a psychiatrist. You have uh, to have a community. You have, <laughs> you really do. Yes. And so that will help kind of tease out mm -hmm. um, what's mine, what's theirs. Yeah. Yeah. I know what I, I have my two daughters, one is just like me and the other is just like her dad. And the one that's just like her dad is, I think, a highly sensitive person. I always said she was an inner circle person. She had just her small group of friends and then everyone else she kept outside of it. But I found when she was about nine, eight or nine, that I, I recognized that she would do things for herself if I wasn't around. But as soon as I was around, she couldn't do it. She didn't. And so I, I went to work and I said, I need to travel. I, I need to, I, I'm, I'm, she's codependent upon me and I need to change this. And it was the right thing to do. And uh, so th thankfully now she is uh, still doing things on her own, <laughs> but I can completely yeah. agree with what you're saying that go ahead. I did want to interject just that um, it, it seems to me like, and I, I don't have hard evidence on this, but um, in comparing with friends, like it is also maybe an asterisk, like if you think that you have sensitive kids or you are sensitive yourself, like as much as you can try not to compare yourself to your friends. And this is maybe a good piece of advice just for anyone anywhere, but yeah. I really struggled with, um, and still, you know, occasionally with, um, comparisonitis, you know, mm. where you're, maybe you have a, a, a church group or a play group, or, you know, when they're toddlers and babies, it's all, everything's new. And you're like, Oh, sleeping. I had kids that didn't sleep through the night very well. And so I had to stop asking, you know, don't ask me about sleep because I'm angry about it. And my kids don't sleep through the night and nothing works. And mm -hmm. I just have to put on the blinders and do what I can do to survive. Um, but often highly sensitive kids will be a little slower, um, slower to grow up, if you will, slower to individuate. Um, they often need a little more um, extra love and mm -hmm. extra TLC. Um, even um, my, 
my oldest daughter just went through learning to drive and had a lot of anxiety. And um, we coached her through a lot of that. Um, and it, it took a lot longer. Um, and, and our son too. Um, so giving them a little bit of a little more grace and a wider mm-hmm. birth to like, not just turn on a dime. Oh, you're 16. Boom. You're going to grow. And, yeah. and Elaine, Aaron talks about this in highly sensitive child because her son was, I think maybe closer to 20 by the time he could get his mind around driving. Um, so there, there are things like that where it's like, it's okay. Like listening to your child, hearing them, like not just listening, but hearing them. I'm sure I've made a boatload of mistakes. Hopefully I've done a few things right, but <laughs> listening and hearing them and not responding right away, but maybe like, okay, I'm, I'm hearing that you're saying you're worried about this and you're right. afraid of this. And I want to go think about that for a little while. And you think about that. Let's talk about it tomorrow, you know, right. like giving them space, giving you space. Um, and that's really hard. Cause like, I don't want, I have this thing, like, I don't want the kids to miss out on opportunities that come their way. And so there've been quite a few things where, you know, one kid wants to go to summer camp and one doesn't. I'm like, I don't want the kid that doesn't want to go to miss out on that, but he doesn't care about that. Right. And right. I, it's me, it's me that I, I had such a wonderful time at summer camp that I would hate for a kid to miss out on that, but he's wired differently. He wants to do different things. And I have, I kind of have to let go. And mm-hmm. so that's where it comes back to like me as a parent and listening to them and not putting my own desires for them, you know, on top. Yeah. So remembering each child is an individual, is an individual. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So how do you change careers and become an author <laughs> in your midlife? Yes. Um, so I, I mentioned that I, uh, have been a writer throughout, uh, whether it's public relations, or um, I started a, a blog for pastors and church leaders that was kind of, it kind of uh, got fe- got created out of the work that I was doing with church mm-hmm. technology companies. I ran that blog as an editor and founder and also like sold the advertising and things like that. I did that for 14 years wow. and sold that last year. Um, and so uh, this is for me where the connection between um, being highly sensitive and an entrepreneur kind of come together, which is sensing the shifts in both you, in the environment, in right. the world, in the economy, um, but really um, knowing when you need to change, um, mm. seeing that writing on the wall, if you will, of, um, and, and for me, it always came in like a dissatisfaction or burnout like going yeah. through several rounds. And I think in 14 years with church tech, I never, I never meant to like run that so long. Um, it just, I couldn't, I, I got the notion that I wanted to sell it and find somebody to take over like um, s- seven years after s- doing it for <laughs> six or seven years. And it took that much longer. Um, and I, I had to both listen to my intuition yeah. that this is, this is not, um, this is a great thing that I created, but I, I need an exit so that I can pivot. It just, it took a long time. Um, and it, it was to my benefit because I was able to grow it. I had to stretch as an entrepreneur and grow a team of people, which I don't love managing people because I manage four kids and a house on top of it. And it takes, (laughs) can you relate? It takes a lot of energy. So I have, um, um, (laughs) there's seven kids in my my family. So I can completely relate in your birth, your birth yes. family. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. So, um, you know, it's exponential, you know, mm-hmm. if you're thinking about going from two to three kids, like it's not, there is no, um, equation like, or one really more than one kid. And it's like, how do I have, how is my schedule blown up? And yet there's only two kids with activities, you know? So, <laughs> um, <clears throat> it really does take a lot. And I'm, um, very, um, intentional, um, and try like try not to have a ton of work stuff in the afternoons when I need to be driving people places yeah. and making dinner for you know often we like last night we ate dinner at 4 45 because everybody had stuff they had to get to we like to be able to sit down as a family so what that means is you know I'm revamping my schedule to make dinner at 4 30 because that's when we can all be together and that's when we need to eat and we don't like to eat crap food you know McDonald's and stuff like that so right. no offense I do like McDonald's but 
we just try not <laughs> to do it that often. And for family six, it's ridiculous. So, <laughs> so um, all that to say, um, I was able to grow and stretch and build these systems in that, um, that blog business and then um, sold that business, made an exit. But before all the advice uh, people had given me was like, start what you want to be doing, start it before you exit your business. Mm. Um, and I, I did that to a degree. So in 2020, so I guess it was like 2018, I got the idea to write the first book, Leaving Christian Science. And then it took me because I was writing. So I started, I started writing books before I had exited mm. my day job, if you will, my, my day um, business. Right. And so it, that meant that it took about two and a half years to finish the manuscript. Um, I started going to writers conferences during that time. Um, it was, it was a good, a good thing to start before the one ended because um, authors don't make a lot of money um, on right one book right. Right. right away. You need, if you're self-publishing, you kind of need an entourage of books and you need to tackle Amazon ads and, um, there's a lot of like businessy stuff that you have to do, um, to make a living at it. Mm -hmm. And I'm still, I'm still, that's a work in process. Um, so starting before ending something else is really valuable. And then, um, uh, getting educated on that market, whatever that is that you want to pivot into, like while you still have income that you can play right. with to put toward that profession mm -hmm. is really good. So I I went to, I don't know, three or four different writers conferences. I joined a, um, Inspire Christian Writers um, in Northern California. Mm -hmm. I got in a critique group, which was super, super valuable through Inspire. Um, and I still have those critique partners today. They nice. have critiqued uh, both my books and now I'm working on um, new new projects. And so uh, building that tribe or that community around you to support you in your mm -hmm. next venture um, right. is really valuable. Um, and then through that process, like um, telling people that you're writing a book and then actually writing the book and mm -hmm. going through that process, going through that process. All right. Well, we had a little bit of technical difficulty. So we're going to take Lauren off camera and uh, just conduct the rest of this with yeah. just her audio. So at least you'll re be able to remember her name. <laughs> <laughs> so the question that I have now is you have um, <clears throat> made a career change and become an author in that midlife point of yours. Uh, you know, how did you do that? Yes, that's a great question. Um, I don't know anybody uh, in their forties, who isn't thinking about some kind of change. Yeah. So I guess it goes with the territory. Um, I got advice to start my next project or venture before I exited, um, the business that I was trying to sell churchtechtoday.com. Um, and so I, I took that advice. I had always wanted to become an author and wasn't sure I had a bunch of different ideas right. and wasn't sure which project I was going to start with. And, um, I, I had been praying about that and I just, all of a sudden it came to me, like, I need to start with my story mm -hmm. out of Christian science. And yeah. so I, um, I started that project in 2018, um, and did it, you know, in the cracks and crevices alongside my, um, my day job business. Um, and so it took a little bit longer, but the benefit was having some income from my day job, if you will, to pour into that um, venture, which um, I had uh, I had written a book proposal and tried to go traditional publishing and was told that the people group I was trying to reach was too small. And so because I'm already an entrepreneur, I really grabbed the bull by both horns and um, learned everything I could about self-publishing by going to writers' conferences. I mm -hmm. uh, got into a critique group and had my partners critique every chapter and nice. just grew a lot. Um, um, and so, so it wasn't a pivot where I like quit one job and started another job the next day. It was like they overlapped quite a bit. Um, and so that was really, uh, really great because I was able to kind of inch into it. Uh, and uh, launched uh, the first book in 2020, and then Write Your Journey um, was fall of 2021. Um, so I kind of came out with a bang. I really enjoyed um, the process and would love to write a book a year. We'll see if that's going to happen this year. 
Um, but really uh, giving yourself space to process what it is you want to do and um, play at the playground, if you will. Um, you know, sometimes you might try something and it might not be the right yeah. fit, but if you're doing that, um, you know, not as a, a quit one job and start, a, start another completely new job, like there is space for that um, curiosity uh, to see if it's a good fit. And so for me, I, I really did enjoy uh, the process of writing and learning. I'm a lifelong learner. And uh, if I'm not growing, I, I being stagnant is like not an option. I don't really enjoy that at all. And so um, now, yeah, now that I've like gone through the challenge of self-publishing twice, I, I can totally tell, oh, I'm like looking for another challenge. Um, the challenge will be like, can I make a living from my books? And the, the yeah. answer is usually not just from books, but it's coaching and consulting and freelance writing and blogging. Um, and so I have two, two blogs, um, hspjourney.com, which I um, have already mentioned, and then another one that is called earnitsaveit.com, and it's a personal finance blog. Uh, so I, I typically will take projects that relate to a passion of mine, and I, uh, as, as HSPs, we don't really enjoy uh, doing stuff that doesn't matter. So I really pursue things that I feel like make a difference and are mm -hmm. things that I'm interested in. So, so that's kind of how I approach things with an open mindset and just looking to, um, to grow and change and evolve, uh, as time goes on in my, in my journey. Awesome. Yeah. I think there's a lot of people that, especially the last two years have kind of brought to light that, you know, they stay in their set career and, and not all, not even always to, to become a, uh, think about becoming a uh, self-employed or a in their business an entrepreneur but they stay in a career because they fear change and it, and it you know it could be these highly sensitive people of which I think I'm probably one but those for those people I think the advice that you just gave is really important that to try things, look for those side hustles. You know, for me, before I retired at, in 2018, I was doing my anti-aging and wellness business for a couple of years. And it gives you that safety net to, to try it, to see if you like it, right? So I think that's important. So we're at the point now where we do rapid fire and I will give you five either words or phrases and you just respond what first comes to your top of your mind. There's no okay. right or wrong answers, but it helps us to get to know you a little bit better. Sure. So you talked about your critique group. What is that group? Give them a shout out. And again, yeah. why did you find that so valuable? That's Great question. So in, in writer, writer speak, um, a critique group is um, a set number of people. Um, I call them my partners, um, my, like my writing partners. So I have two, which is kind of small. We're a trio. Um, we used to meet every week um, and we've been on Zoom for a while because of COVID. Uh, so we meet every Wednesday morning for two hours hours, like a block. Mm -hmm. um, we have a submission deadline. So each of us submits up to 3,000 words of either whatever project we're on, or if you're in the middle of a project, you can pause and throw a blog post in to have, you know, your group mm -hmm. look at it. So basically it's like editing partners. Mm. Um, so you email submit, um, each of us submits to each other. My two partners, Don and Libby, are both writing fiction projects right now. So, so I'm nonfiction or poetry and their um, fiction at the moment. So there's variety. Um, you get to know your your friends, really, your partners really, really well yeah. because you're talking about life. So it, it ticks the box for me. One of the reasons I loved um, studying literature in college was all of the deep conversations that we would have about life themes and, um, you know, all the stuff we talked about journey. Like that's what I, that's what I adored. Um, and so that is, um, is wonderful for me. And it often, they're like a part of my, um, my wellness team, if you yeah. will, because I, I write about a lot of personal things and faith issues. And so we have really in-depth conversations. Um, we meet in person from time to time now. Um, and so 
it's really valuable. You also learn to take criticism in yes. a positive way. And that is huge. And initially mm. that was the biggest, uh, the biggest struggle uh, for me to becoming a professional book author is you put yourself out there, you put it all out, it's all hanging out, you you get feedback and you need to be a big girl or big boy in mm -hmm. the way that you take that feedback. And there are um, there are kind of guidelines that usually groups, if a if a writing organization has critique groups, they're, uh, they're guidelines for these groups. So you are um, sharing positive things, you're sharing negative things, you're not like yelling at them like how <laughs> terrible they are. So it's very constructive. Um, and it, it also, like as a highly sensitive person, it, it has built up my skin to be able to take constructive criticism much better than I used to. And I think that it also leads you to the next word that I have, which is, what does confidence mean to you? Uh, yes, and that's so important to your your business and your role. Um, confidence means to me uh, sitting sitting inside yourself and being okay with your skin, okay with your body, okay with who you are, okay with how God made you. Um, you know, uh, it's okay to not be okay. So that yes. doesn't mean uh, like if you don't love everything about yourself right now at the moment that you can't adjust, but it you know, it's like the opposite of self-loathing, -lo you know, mm -hmm. you, you accept yourself as you are, all your flaws, all your imperfections, and you're ready to tackle whatever gets put in front of you next. So true. A lot of times people don't get to the next step or are frustrated with life and they have all kinds of excuses, but it's really a lot of it comes from the fear of change. What would you say yeah. to people, especially a highly sensitive person who may have that fear of change? That is a struggle um, because when you get, you know, the people, a lot of people have a proclivity to like get things just right in their life. And then they don't want, they don't want any change because they, they finally got it just to the point that they need it. Yeah. Um, but change, you know, it happens whether you want it to or not. Um, this is, this is life. I mean, mm -hmm. having, so having a growth mindset or, or a closed mindset that often can be a huge indicator of how someone deals with change. And, um, I struggle to understand the person with a closed mindset just because I, I've always had like a natural open growth mindset, uh, but I do have compassion um, for, for the person that's, cause there's, there's a story there. Yeah. There's a story there to why it's so hard to embrace change. And often I think fear is back there uh, defining those reasons why. Mm -hmm. So taking a closer look at that, that fear and that anxiety um, that you're pulling away from that, that can be the indicator of how to, how to get over the hurdle. Yeah. And I think sometimes whenever you start to, and even if it's not for a book or a movie, but if you start to just write down your story, you start to uncover the root cause of, of some of those fears that you have. And once you know that, then, then you can start to change to um, overcome them. So you take change to the positive. Absolutely. What is your next book? <laughs> I have two. Um, yeah. Two that I'm working on. Uh, one is a book of essays and poems. Nice. Um, I have quite a few years of poetry that I've, I've actually <laughs> gone through and edited. <laughs> You're laughing. You're like, I do too. Um, <laughs> I used to when I was younger. I actually have not done it in a long, long time, but you're making me inspired. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I have a book of essays and, and poetry that uh, I'm, it's it's sitting on a shelf because I wrote the uh, Write Your Journey book last year and that that was like right in the middle. And this idea came to me and I was like, yes, I just need to get this done. Um, so that happens. And that also is like the downside of, 
being empathic and highly sensitive, it's like, oh, I need to go. This is more important today. And, you know, <laughs> all done, you know, instead of like, wait, I had a plan and it was on a spreadsheet. Like I'm not. Oh, the shiny me. objects got you. <laughs> I don't follow my own rules very often. I say like, oh, I, I, I'm good at breaking my rules and other people's rules. You know? oh. <laughs> but, um, and then I, I'm working, I, I'm working on, um, an idea for, um, uh, uh, devotions for um, former Christian Zionists who are trying to unpack some of their religious trauma. Yeah, and so that is um, near and dear to my heart. Uh, there is quite a bit of religious trauma, um, like out there in the news currently, and um, so that's a whole that's a whole separate separate that's a topic. Whole new yes. podcast. <laughs> yes, there you go. <laughs> Okay, the final thing is you have four kids. You said six. And again, I can totally relate. Four. To that. Yep, four kids, six in Six our in the family, right? Yes. So, you know, we had ended up with um, seven kids and two, mom and dad. We took a trip across country, took two weeks to go from Pittsburgh to California and back. If you were taking your kids on a family trip, knowing that, and my husband or my dad was kind of like your husband. He, he set a limit of how much he would drive each day. <laughs> so if we stayed within your husband's limit, <clears throat> where would you like to take your kids? Um, that is a good question. We, um, I'd love to go to the Grand Canyon. We, we actually, I got to go just with my husband last summer when we took our son to college in Arizona um, and it would be great to go back there. And it's, it's like a 12 hour drive. Um, you can do it all in one day, pretty, pretty easily, but we'll see. We'll see. I, I know you probably know this, but as kids get older, they don't always want to do what you want to do. So we, we may have missed the boat on a long car trip. We'll see. <laughs> you know, I, I think that, that was one of the blessings that, that God gave me because my kids now, even my married kids <laughs> with her husband and two kids will go home to Pittsburgh with us to see my, wow. my family. And it's a 12 hour drive. So we do it actually in two stints. We do either two hours um, and then a 10 hour drive or uh, two five hour drives. But it's actually kind of great to do this um, with the kids and the family. How fun. Right. <clears throat> but anyway. What a blessing. Yeah. That's great. Yeah, definitely a blessing. Well, it, speaking of blessing, has been wonderful talking with you. I'm going to share my screen so the folks can see how they can get in touch with you. So this is my warning to those that are looking at the video to um, get ready to do a screenshot or get a pen and pencil. <laughs> I will read out for the, those that are just listening in audio the information. Just a couple things for how to get in touch with Lauren. She has been showing her PR skills and has been announcing all throughout this information. But just in case she didn't write it down, <laughs> her email is Lauren, L-A-U-R-E-N at laurenhunter.net. So L-A-U-R-E-N-H-U-N-T-E-R.net. Easy. First name, last name. Perfect. Dot. Yep. And the website is www.laurenhunter.net. So easy peasy. Please Great. take advantage of uh, checking out her website and those tools that she mentioned are out there and also look at her blog. I'm going to just, before I uh, stop sharing, wanted to just do, as I always do, a little pitch for the book that I am a one of the 21 authors of a book by Laura uh, Rochelle Lawson, and it is unstoppable. It is available on Amazon uh, as an ebook for just $1.99, being fierce, fearless, and unfuckwithable in life and business. And it's a bunch of compilation of stories of women just like me who overcame challenges and gained their confidence. Thank you so much. I appreciate the time that we spent together. I hope the audience enjoyed as much as I did getting to know Lauren Hunter a lot better. Uh, thank you for sharing your story, some really great advice, great tips and tools that you mentioned. And shout outs to all of the authors that you talked about 
that our audience can also, as they listen to the replay, have your pen and pencil out so that you can write down some of these other authors to give you more tools to help if you have a highly sensitive child, husband, or yourself. Uh, you can learn more again by visiting her website at https colon forward slash forward slash l-a-u-r-e-n-h-u-n-t-e-r dot net lauren hunter dot net and please <laughs> thank you vicky please reach out for questions that you might have with her um we will uh definitely be talking again with lauren to to see where she is with her ventures and some of the other topics that she brought up that I think you all would enjoy. So again, until we meet, uh, uh, until next time, just please remember that life is a journey and it's up to you to enjoy the ride. This is Vicki Nettling from the Find Your, Le Your Leadership Confidence podcast signing off. Thank you for tuning into the Find Your Leadership Confidence podcast with Vicki Nettling where we share impactful lessons that help you grow as an individual, grow your confidence, and find the positive and good within you so you powerfully and authentically become the best version of yourself. Remember to visit our website at www.findyourleadershipconfidence.com and enjoy even more great episodes like this one. Again, while you're here, subscribe to us via your favorite network. We look forward to seeing you next time on the Find Your Leadership Confidence Podcast.